Well, as we mentioned in the last video, wireless LAN controllers can introduce some complexities into our network. It's one of the reasons why some vendors have gone exclusively cloud and they tout the benefits and the simplicity of a cloud managed environment. But there are a lot of architectures out there today that still rely on wireless LAN controllers. Let's go ahead and understand what exactly a wireless LAN controller is and what some of these considerations are that we need to take when we're incorporating them into our designs. So as we've mentioned, a lightweight access point can do nothing apart from a controller. It's going to have to associate to some kind of controller in order to function, whether that's a cloud managed solution or once again, a wireless LAN controller. So what exactly is a wireless LAN controller all about? Well, a wireless LAN controller, it can take on a lot of different forms actually. So most commonly we think of wireless LAN controllers as being a physical appliance. This physical appliance is going to get installed into a network rack. It has network ports and it's going to be a little bit expensive because I have to purchase something that, you know, has a lot of hardware in it and is capable of handling all of these access points. But the good news is it's a one-time spend as opposed to maybe a monthly subscription. Now we can take on other forms as well here. For example, a lot of vendors now offer a virtual appliance as well. The concept of a virtual appliance is kind of interesting. It's basically a software version of the hardware that appears here in the physical appliance. In fact, it's often the exact same software, whether I purchase a physical or virtual appliance. The difference is this is going to cost me less money. However, it also doesn't come with any hardware. <laughs> There's a lot of hardware that I pay for in the physical appliance. And so I'm going to have to deploy this into my virtual environment. So I'll probably deploy it as virtual machines. And this is usually going to involve servers. And so I'm still paying for the hardware. I'm just paying for the hardware here. And then I can possibly share that server with other virtual appliances and such. So this is very commonly what people do these days. However, physical appliances definitely still have value, especially when it comes to tunneling. Now this can also actually show up as an embedded concept. So we might see an embedded controller on the access points themselves. This is an interesting one because we just said lightweight access points require a controller. So what are we talking about here? Well, what can happen is if we've got a small site, I might have, let's just say three or four access points here. We'll say four. So I've got four access points. And do I really want to go out and purchase a physical appliance or a virtual appliance, some kind of wireless LAN controller for this very small site? Well, maybe what I could do instead is I can use an embedded controller on one of the access points. A lot of vendors support this, especially Aruba and Cisco are known for this. And so I can convert this access point here into a wireless LAN controller. In fact, it can play both roles at the same time. It can have an access point functionality still while running the wireless LAN controller, oftentimes as what we call a container service. So this basically just means that it's leveraging the hardware of the access point to run different software and usually built on some kind of Linux operating system. All that to say, what we're going to do is allow these other access points to connect to this access point over here, including itself. All four of these access points are going to connect to the wireless LAN controller instance that's running on that access point. And then for me as the admin, I would still log into the wireless LAN controller and configure my access points that way. That's a pretty cool option for sure, but it really is intended for smaller environments. So keep that in mind. Now all of these devices are going to need network access, especially when we look at the physical and virtual appliances. And so a lot of these appliances will have 10 or 40 or even 100 gig connections to the network because it has to facilitate all of the access points connecting to it. And the larger the scale, the more bandwidth we're going to need. Now, if I purchase a physical appliance, it's going to come with those ports. If I purchase the virtual appliance, then I'm going to need to provide these ports on the server because we are going to need a whole lot of network traffic still. And this is where, you know, even purchasing a virtual appliance, we might end up paying for a lot of hardware that we maybe could have just purchased a physical appliance at that point for. But again, if we've got a server where we can share resources, then it does make sense to do so. Now, a big challenge with wireless LAN controllers is the discovery process. If I have a cloud managed solution, the access point knows how to get out to the cloud because it's been pre-configured with this. This cloud connection is embedded in the code of the access point because this cloud system, it never moves. It never changes. It's got the same IP address or the same DNS resolution, no matter who's deploying the access points. But this naturally isn't going to work from a wireless LAN controller perspective because my wireless LAN controller, it could be anywhere in my network. And because it could be anywhere, it could have any IP address. 
And so we're going to need to come up with a little more sophisticated method for discovering the wireless LAN controllers as an access point boots. So the process is going to look something like this. The access point is going to boot up and it's going to check its local configuration because it can store local information, not necessarily you know, channels or radio power because that's dynamic and depends on the wireless LAN controller. But it can store local information such as, hey, where are my controllers, especially if I've booted up before. From there, we've got a lot of different options for finding our controllers. One of the most popular is going to be what we call DHCP and then option 43. When we do DHCP, this is our dynamic process for getting an IP address. And we already mentioned that lightweight access points can now use DHCP, and this is another reason why we'd want to do so. I boot up, I get an IP address from the DHCP server, but the DHCP server can do more than just hand out an IP address. Using one of these options, such as option 43, we can provide other information. And so option 43 allows me to provide a list of wireless LAN controllers. So I could say here's wireless LAN controller one, here's wireless LAN controller two, and maybe even here's wireless LAN controller three. And so now I've got a primary, secondary, and tertiary controller that I add to my configuration. Now, if I'm not using DHCP or my DHCP server doesn't support option 43, even though it is commonly supported, we could look at another option. We could look at DNS resolution as another way of discovering the WLC. And so oftentimes each vendor will have a very specific name resolution to look for. And so maybe we'll try to resolve the vendor name and then dash WLC and then whatever our local domain is, which by the way, we are getting the local domain as part of our DHCP process. And so I run a resolution against this name. And at this point I can get a wireless LAN controller IP address. Now I can only get a single wireless LAN controller IP here. And so the access point might connect to that specific wireless LAN controller. And then that WLC can pass down redundant to WLCs as part of the process. So I can still get my list. I just won't get it as part of the DNS process. Now, another option that doesn't always work very well because <laughs> it requires a smaller network is that the access points can also perform a broadcast. A broadcast message is only going to go within a VLAN or a layer two domain. And so this broadcast is going to work just fine if the access point is connecting to a switch here and the wireless LAN controller is also connected to a switch and they're on the same VLAN, it's all part of the same layer two domain. But that's going to work just fine to send out a broadcast. However, as soon as my network gets a little more complex and now it actually goes through a router a layer three domain here to get to the wireless LAN controllers over here, let's say, and my wireless LAN controller is no longer associated or connected with that original VLAN. Well, now a broadcast isn't going to work because broadcasts only go as far as the layer two domain and then they are cut off. And so at that point, I'm going to have to use DHCP or possibly DNS in order to find the wireless LAN controller over here. Now, lastly, a lot of vendors do still allow me as the admin to do a manual configuration. And so remember my example where I had all my access points on my desk and I was moving my console cable around and configuring them. Uh, this still is an option. It's certainly not ideal, but it is something we could do. We could get in there. We could configure my list of access point or wireless line controllers rather. So I could do wireless line controller one, WLC two, WLC three, and I can do that manual configuration on every access point. It's just not going to scale. We give up scalability here once again, because we're basically reverting to autonomous configuration at least it's only for the sake of finding a controller, but it is still manual. Now, once the access point does find the wireless line controller, it will connect to it and it will form that tunnel, which we're going to talk about more in the next video. Now, there are definitely some design implications that we need to consider because well, vendors do still have wireless line controllers that are going to go into the network. And so that's going to impact our design in a number of different ways if that's the solution we're choosing to use. So we already talked about it, but we do need to consider licensing and generally sizing of the wireless LAN controllers because a wireless LAN controller typically will support some number of access points. Now, it varies by vendor. We might have a wireless LAN controller that just straight up supports 100 access points, but we might have one that can support 100, 150, or 200 depending on the licensing. And so from a hardware perspective, it's limited to 200, but I might purchase it and by default it supports 100 and I would have to pay for more licensing if I want 150 or 200. But we still have to be careful. Again, anytime we're talking about hardware, we'll have hardware limitations. And so if I have to install a 201st access point, eh, that's going to be a bad day. And so we need to take this into account and we need to have growth factored into our design. Because if I have, let's say, 185 access points today, 
uh, okay, this wireless LAN controller model will support that, but yeah, you know, that's less than 10% growth at this point to get up to 200. And so the reality is if I add a small side or I just need to bolster up my wireless solution a little bit, then there's going to be growth involved. And I'm really risking a lot here because a wireless LAN controller is very expensive to rip and replace. We want that to last five or six years before we have to invest in hardware once again. We also need to consider failover. And so we'll just write this out as redundancy. Redundancy is a big concern because if I have a single wireless LAN controller and I've got a bunch of access points out here that are all connecting into that wireless LAN controller, what happens if the wireless LAN controller fails? At this point, I would hopefully have another WLC that those access points can you know, resolve to. Again, we're typically providing a list, like we said, of several wireless LAN controllers for the purpose of redundancy. These access points need to stay associated with a controller, otherwise they will go down and they'll take the Wi-Fi network down with them. And this is well and good, other than wireless LAN controller redundancy starts to get a little bit complicated, because is this per site, or is it for the entire organization? And furthermore, how do I license these? Let's say I have 35 access points, I decide that a 50 access point controller is good enough. Well, do I license both of these for 50 access points? Because now I'm paying for a lot of licensing that I'm never going to need. But at the same time, I need to support all 35 on one of those wireless line controllers in the event of a failure. Otherwise, I could load balance between them. Now, some vendors support the concept of hot standby, which means that they share licensing. And so that issue can be resolved. But we do need to make sure that we are deploying a redundant solution and furthermore, we need to consider where on the network the wireless LAN controllers will go, and we'll be talking about that as part of our tunneling conversation. So wireless LAN controllers, they are at the heart of a lightweight architecture. In a lot of cases, we're still deploying wireless LAN controllers as part of some of these solutions. So if it's not based in the cloud, it's going to be based in my network somewhere. And as we saw, that can take a lot of different forms, whether it's a physical appliance, virtual appliance, etc. Now, our lightweight access points they have to discover the wireless LAN controller. If again, in a cloud solution, that it's simple to do that because I just resolve my DNS or whatever, the access points are pre-configured with that and they can go out and find the cloud. Whereas with my network, they have no idea where the wireless LAN controller is. And so maybe we'll do DHCP option 43. It's a very popular option. We might do DNS, we might do broadcast. And so we've got a lot of different ways of doing that uh, up to and including potentially manually configuring those access points, which is not ideal, but we can do it. Now, lastly, we've got to make a lot of design considerations here with wireless LAN controllers. We have to think about the form factor like we talked about. We also have to think about the licensing. We have to think about the redundancy. And so there's a lot of different considerations we have to make as far as these wireless LAN controllers are concerned. We also have to consider where in the network we're deploying these. And so we'll find that the location of the wireless LAN controller matters a lot when we are tunneling our wireless clients. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click here to subscribe to CBT Nuggets and click the notification bell to make sure that you're aware of every time we post new content. If you're interested in a career in IT or you want to brush up on your IT skills, then swing over to our website and while you're there, be sure to sign up for a free trial.